Welcome back to Harbor Unbox. Today, we are taking a look at a product that I wish, I wish I never bought because boy, oh boy, did this thing end up shafting me. Wasted just heaps of my time. It was very painful, but I'm going to use it as an opportunity to include some info that I would usually skip over in our reviews of pre-release products as technically that sort of information is not really relevant if the issue is solved, let's say, before the product's publicly available. So if we had maybe a driver issue with a particular graphics product in a certain game, but the issue was fixed before the review was finished, then we would normally just not bother mentioning that because, well, it's become a non-issue for the, the buyers of the product because by the time you get your hands on it, problem solved, it was just at a painful part of the review process. And in instances where I have mentioned a bit of a messy review process, let's say, uh, Basically, there were numerous issues with the product that probably heavily limited my time with it. So I had to explain why the review was probably cut a bit short. I didn't have the information we would like, or probably more that there were ongoing issues that were worth bringing to your attention as a potential buyer. Anyway, in this example, I did buy the product. It has been publicly available for weeks now. So I'm very much coming at this one from the angle uh, of a consumer. So someone that bought the product. So yeah, I'm, I'm more critical of products that you can go out and buy because really issues like the ones that I have with this board should have been solved or addressed or not even happened before they were publicly available. The good news though, in this example, I was able to contact the manufacturer, so ASRock, inform them of the various issues that I was having and got them to mostly fix them. Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Gigabyte's GeForce RTX 40 series laptops. The Aorus 15X and 17X are premium gaming machines with up to NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4090 laptop graphics, delivering a great ray tracing experience in a performance optimized design. Thanks to the new Ada Lovelace architecture, these new systems support DLSS3 frame generation, enhanced max Q efficiency, and super fast AI acceleration. You may also be tempted by the excellent Gigabyte G5, which offers a range of powerful RTX 40 series GPUs and the latest 13th gen Intel processors, all in an attractive, great value package. For creators on the go, Gigabyte's Aero series have you covered. The Aero 14 is just 17mm thin, supports HDMI 2.1 and Thunderbolt 4, plus it has fast CPU and GPU options. Need a bit more screen real estate? The Aero 16 has you covered. For more information, please click the link in the video description. So let's rewind a little bit. Late last month, AMD announced their entry-level A620 chipset for the AM5 platform, promising sub $100 US motherboards supporting Ryzen 7000 series processors. One of the first announced and released motherboards to use this affordable chipset was ASRock's A620M-HDV-M.2+, which was also available without the Plus, featuring a cut-down VRM. And it has to be said, such an affordable AM5 motherboard is certainly an alluring prospect for many of you, and as such, dozens of our Floatplane and Patreon members asked for me to test it out. So I've purchased the M.2 Plus version from UEG as it features an actual VRM heatsink, and at the time of purchasing included support for 170 watt CPUs, such as the Ryzen 9 7950X on the CPU support list. So I was very keen to see what the A620M-HDV slash M.2 Plus could do, especially after having been so impressed with the ASRock B650M-HDV slash M.2 just weeks earlier. The B650 version of the HDV is an excellent value motherboard, and at present costs just $120 US, and amazingly has no issues powering the Ryzen 9 7950X with its 850 amp power stages. And I would say this is the best B650 motherboard on the market right now. The question is though, could the same VRM, but with two fewer 50 amp power stages, so half a dozen in total, be enough to tackle the 7950X? Now you might say, why does it matter? No one is going to pair a 16 core CPU with a cheap A620 board. Now, that might be true, though I'd never like to be the one making such an assumption. Rather, I'd like to know exactly what the product I'm buying can and can't do, especially if I'm interested in taking advantage of AM5's platform longevity with future upgrades, possibly to a more powerful higher-end CPU. After all, if the B650M-HDV-M.2 can run the 7950X at full speed, just fine without any kind of thermal or throttling issues, 
Is it worth saving a further $20 on this A620 version? Well, the intention of this content is to find out. So I've purchased one from Newegg, I've thrown it in our test system, and I've got to work. The first stop was to visit the Azeroth website and download the latest BIOS revision, as it's always best practice to update a motherboard before testing. The latest BIOS available at the time was version 1.19.AS05, so I flashed the A620 board installed the 7950X, which is a CPU that was on the CPU support list going into all of this testing. Now it has to be said that the 7950X is the ultimate VRM benchmark, given that it's the most powerful AM5 processor currently available. Now when running our Cinebench R23 all-core workload, what I found out almost instantly was hardware info detecting thermal throttling, but this wasn't a CPU issue, rather it appeared to be the VRM throttling. The A620 board would only let the 7950X briefly run without power limits before enforcing a 90 watt cap. And this was a bit strange because we were only measuring a VRM temperature of 70 degrees, which is reasonably cool. But the worst part were how the power limits were being enforced. Rather than just clocking all the cores down to an appropriate frequency that fit within the power limit, the board would let as many cores run at the maximum frequency as it could, while slashing other cores down to 544 megahertz. And this caused horrible stuttering in games with the 7950X. Basically the board was broken with the 16 core CPU. So I decided to try the 7700X. The Ryzen 7 processor is a 105 watt part, so surely it would work. But again, the board enforced a 90 watt limit, which saw the CPU running well below the TJ Maxx, but it again meant that at least half of the cores were clocking down to 544 megahertz, resulting in terrible all-core performance and even issues when gaming. So surely the 7600X would work, but sadly, no, that wasn't the case. The same issues were again present. And despite having just six cores, around half of them were clocking down to 544 megahertz under load. I then installed the 65 watt Ryzen 9 7900, and while there was a lot less throttling here, performance overall was still bad as some cores were still dropping down to that dreaded 544 megahertz. I decided to fire up Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is quite a CPU intensive game, and found that after 20 minutes of walking around the village section that we use for benchmarking, performance was up around 310 FPS, which I believe is normal, but after walking around for another 10 minutes, Thermal throttling started to kick in and the frame rate did lower and the 1% lows were even worse. So I came back to the same area as before and noticed that frame rates were now fluctuating between 220 and 260 FPS. And that's quite a dip from the fairly steady 310 FPS I was seeing prior. After consulting the digital thermometer, I discovered that the rear PCB temperature was indeed back up to 70 degrees and the cores were down clocking to 544 megahertz causing the loss of performance just seen in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. At this point, I knew something was up. The board couldn't possibly be this bad. So I reached out to ASRock on April 14th, informed them of my findings. They replied, explaining that I should use the latest BIOS revision, which I was. And they then asked me for some details about the test system, which hadn't changed from all of my previous B650 testing. They then wrapped up their reply simply by saying, my results differ to theirs. So that being the case, I went ahead and wasted a further three days trying to get the board to work correctly with no success. I recorded more footage like what you can see here where performance with the 7700X degrades with every single Cinebench R23 run, so something was obviously wrong. Then three days after my initial reply from ASRock, they sent another email on the 17th informing that there was a new BIOS that I should install which fixes CPU performance. So that sounded very promising. That was version 1.19.AS07. But the real kicker was the second part of their email where they told me that the ASRock A620M-HDV slash M.2 Plus doesn't support 170 watt CPUs and that I should check the CPU support list. And sure enough, upon adding the new BIOS revision to the website, ASRock removed 170 watt CPUs from their support list. So to be clear, prior to my emails, ASRock was advertising this A620 motherboard to support 170 watt CPUs on their CPU support list, but now that is no longer a thing. After informing ASRock that I had in fact checked the CPU support page before buying the board, and was aware that as of the 16th, 170 watt CPUs were on the support list, they confirmed that, yeah, I was correct about that. They had since removed support because, well, the board wasn't meant to support 170 watt CPUs, so that was a mistake, which 
Okay, fair enough. But by this point, I'd now wasted three days testing this thing, and now it would seem the data was largely irrelevant as we had a new BIOS, which ASRock claimed does fix CPU performance. The good news though being that after all of this, ASRock did manage to fix the board, or at least for 65, 105, and 120 watt processors, while officially removing support for 170 watt models, though the board will still boot with those models installed. Here's a look at how the A620 board behaves with both BIOS revisions in Cinebench R23's 10 minute loop test. As you can see, the original AS05 BIOS was very broken, and with the fixed version, the 7700X was almost 80% faster. Though oddly, the 7800X 3D only saw a 9% boost, as the original performance wasn't nearly as bad. Inconsistent performance does occur though when thermal throttling is introduced, even when using a 3 run average. The good news though is that with the latest BIOS, the 7800X 3D and 7700X are now performing as they should, delivering comparable performance on the A620 board to that of B650 and even X670 models. And the same is also true for the Ryzen 9 7900 which saw a 31% increase with the new BIOS, boosting the score to 24,504 points which is roughly where it should be. The 7950X though, which is a 170 watt part and isn't supported officially anymore, well, that doesn't perform as it should, though the new BIOS is a massive improvement over what we were seeing with the previous revision. But a score of 21,356 points will be as good as it gets for this A620 board for the 7950X, and that's a score that is 44% lower than what it should be. Still, the 120 watt 7950X 3D worked as expected with the latest BIOS, scoring an impressive 35,751 points, an 86% improvement over the previous BIOS revision. Now, the Cinebench R23 single core performance is where it should be, as this is a very light load test which doesn't stress the VRM, so both BIOS revisions do work here. In games though, we did see that for the most part, there is a big difference between the two BIOS revisions, especially if you're going to stress test for a long period of time, which we've done here. These are 30 minute stress tests, not just the usual 60 second benchmark passes. And the only exception was the 7800X 3D, which should have suffered more with the AS05 BIOS when compared to the 7900, but for some reason it just didn't. Perhaps the 3D V cache is helping avoid a noticeable performance loss as the cores throttle. Anyway, for most of the CPUs, after a warm up period, we found performance was very poor with the original BIOS, but with the updated version, which addresses CPU performance, CPU performance in games is now as expected. And here's a look at VRM thermals. Starting from the top of our graph, we see that the 7950X 3D is now pushing the board up to 82 degrees with the latest BIOS, whereas previously the board had a 70 degree thermal cap. The 7950X on the other hand is now up around 92 degrees, and I suspect the board now has a 90 degree thermal cap or well, it really could be up around 100 degrees, let's say, depending on where ASRock is measuring from, but from the rear side of the PCB, the peak temperature is now 90 degrees. Interestingly, the 7900 and 7800X 3D are now performing better and running cooler with the new bar, so I suspect ASRock has gone and done some voltage optimization as well. Then we have the 7700X, which sees a six degree increase in VRM temperatures with the latest BIOS revision. And for those of you wondering, this is how the A620M-HDV slash M.2 Plus compares to entry-level B650 boards when running the 7950X. As you can see, with around a 90 degree thermal cap, the CPU is averaging a clock frequency of just 3,615 MHz, which is almost 30% lower than most B650 boards. And here's how that translates to performance, just 21,356 points, which means ASRock's own budget HDV B650 board is 75% faster. And keep in mind that board costs just $20 US more. So there you have it. It's been a long journey for us with the A620M-HDV slash M.2 Plus. And while I'm glad we were able to push ASRock to fix the board as quickly as they did, at the end of the day, this it's just not a product that you should even consider. There's just no getting around the fact that it is $20 cheaper than ASRock's own B650M-HDV slash M.2 a board that can support all Ryzen 7000 series processors without any performance or thermal concerns. Not only that, but the extra $20 for the B650 board buys you two and a half gigabit LAN, whereas the A620 board's limited to just gigabit LAN. You also get PCIe 5.0 M.2 support with a heat spreader, whereas the A620 board is limited to PCIe 4.0 and there's no heat spreader. There's more USB ports on the IO panel and you get better USB support in general. You also get a pre-installed IO shield. 
And on top of that, you also get better PCI expansion support with a second PCIe times 16 slot wired for times four bandwidth. And this is replaced with a times one slot on the A620 model. In short, the A620 HDV is a massive downgrade from the B650 HDV. It is simply not worth all the drawbacks to save a measly $20. And the AM5 platform, it also promises broad platform compatibility with support for multiple upcoming CPU generations. So limiting support now to save $20, it just seems like a bad idea. But this brings me to my biggest concern with the A620M-HDV slash M.2 Plus and motherboards like it. If you come away from this video knowing all of the facts about this board and you still decide to save the $20 and get it, fine. You're certainly free to do so. But what I'm not keen on is someone purchasing this motherboard under the impression that it supports all AMD socket AM5 Ryzen 7000 series processors, and that's what ASRock's product page claims on the overview and specification tabs. And worse still, up until just a few days ago, even the CPU support list page noted support for 170 watt processors. But thankfully, we were able to get ASRock to fix that. ASRock also offers a non-plus version of this board with two of the six power stages removed, creating a four-phase board which only supports 65 watt processors. Thing is though, unless you specifically visit the product page and check the CPU support list, you'd never know this. Again, the product advertises and claims to support AMD Socket AM5 Ryzen 7000 series processors, and the specifications table lists under CPU, supports AMD socket AM5 Ryzen 7000 series processors, and it's not until you click on the support tab, then the CPU support list, that you discover that just 65 watt models are supported. What ASRock should have done here in my opinion is name the A620M-HDV slash M.2 Plus as the A620M-HDV slash 120W, and the non plus as the A620M dash HDV slash 65W, because the real CPU support for each motherboard is significantly more important than knowing if the secondary M.2 slot is connected to the CPU or the chipset, which isn't even made clear in the product name anyway. And I don't mean to just pick on ASRock here. This is something I've grilled AMD about over the past week. They really need some kind of validation program to ensure their customers are getting the support they deserve. Looking over A620 motherboards from other partners, we see that MSI claims support for 170 watt CPUs on their Pro A620M-E, which I've got to say has a pretty awful looking VRM. I haven't tested it, so I can't say for sure, but I'd be very impressed if that board supports 170 watt CPUs correctly. Gigabyte also claims 170 watt CPU support on their A620M Gaming X, though that board does look like it has a chance of supporting parts like the 7950X. And then we have ASUS, who also lists support for 170 watt CPUs on their Prime A620M-A-CSM, and I'd be very surprised if it actually does, at least at the expected level of performance. And that means if the ASUS and MSI boards are indeed limited to 120 watt or even 60 watt parts, like I suspect, they really need some kind of indication of this in the product name. And on that note, online retailer Newegg is doing a better job than ASRock of informing customers that these A620 boards are limited to 65 watt and 120 watt parts by including that information in the listing's title. So great job there, Newegg. Anyway, hopefully this is something we can improve on the AMD side of things moving forward, as we've been pretty unsuccessful in our attempts to solve this issue for budget Intel boards which are a complete and utter disaster and a real minefield for consumers. But we'll keep pushing there as well, at least when we get a chance. I know a lot of you have asked for B760 board reviews and stuff like that. Obviously, we've invested a lot of time on the AM5 front at this point, not because we prefer AMD, but because AM5 is a platform that will be used for at least two more generations of CPUs. So therefore, it makes sense to invest the time there whereas the Intel 700 series of boards will be pretty well dead after, well, this point forward. No more future CPU generations or at least new architectures on those boards. I'll try and get to them, but I am prioritizing AM5 for the reason just mentioned. Better investment on our end. And there's obviously a lot of you interested in AM5 as well. Anyway, gonna do it for this video. Hopefully, you enjoyed the sort of, sort of different approach to testing motherboards because of all the issues we have with this publicly available board. Uh, I do have one more B650 board, the Gigabyte MK, 
MK board. Uh, I'll be checking that out soon and seeing if that's any good because that's available like $120 as well, similar to the HDV B650. So, and then there'll be, I've got a dozen other B650 boards already tested, sort of the mid range, and then I'll look at the high end boards. So there's a lot more AM5 B650 stuff coming up. Probably mostly done with A620 for now. I don't just, I can't see how it's worth it unless you're getting these boards for like $50. I don't see it. Anyway, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. Uh, float plane Patreon if you want to get more involved. I I provided a bit of sort of BTS information, behind the scenes information about this board as I was testing it uh, and sort of explaining my journey as I went because it was quite frustrating. Uh, but we we sort of got there in the end. Float plane Patreon, you get access to our exclusive Discord server where I talk about products like this, behind the scenes content, Q and A's, and monthly live streams. Check it out if you're interested. If not, that's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.